Uh, hey, yeah, here we're doing a coffee compiler club to talk about who knows what language runtimes and how to implement fast time, fast, high quality, efficient time, and every other thing to do with compilers or language runtimes. Um, not to mention any particular names by name that are having issues with their clock or anything. That's pretty funny. Uh, are we all being recorded live? We'll show up on YouTube in a few hours, a few days. And uh, that's it. No set agenda. Although we can talk about clock updates, but only in generic terms. I actually, yeah. I, I was just thinking about want some my of clock to be a consistent global, and physics seems to think that time itself is eventual consistency. It's it's a harder problem to solve than it seems. Yeah, it's we've come a long way though. Like I was trying to think. Like I don't, and it's like I only think in Java. Like I'm not sure if current time millis has become like monotonically increasing. I don't. I don't think so. Current time but I'm millis. Like, no, no, no. Current time millis has been monotonically increasing since forever, because back in the day there were plenty of folks who assumed a happens before relationship on the x86 clock cycle when a current time millis ticked one low bit, and that had to get debugged, and that turned into uh, it does like a read of the best. Get time of day from Lin Linux version gets a read from the best get time of day, which fills in like 50 or 64 bytes or something, some big pile of bytes. Then it, then it reads it a second time to see if it gets the same pile of bytes. So it didn't get a in the middle of an update kind of thing. And once it has a consistent set of bytes, it then does the math, give you millis. So it's not not necessarily the fastest thing on the planet, but it but, you but know, as long as Linux promises it doesn't roll that clock backwards, you're you're okay. Right, right, and and some of this is like the last time I worked on so way back in the day at uh, at Tangasol, yep. right, the company with Gene and Cam, we had a clock like we had a safe layer around our clock to hide things like when the OS clock would jump backwards, which it definitely did twenty years ago. Okay. and like I seem to remember the clock twenty years ago being impacted by daylight savings time, and like oh. Like it shouldn't be, and I'm like, I wonder how uh, how much better it is now. I thought NTP was supposedly. I, I mean, I knew there were bugs in the day where clock fucked around, but at NTP, I thought pretty good. Monitor right, it rolls forward. Right, but like if you think like back then, it was like we actually had Windows deployments. Yeah, and okay. like and no Windows NTP, and like yeah. I seem to recall like despite the current time really supposed to be UTC, yeah. like Windows would just give you like local time. Like it was yeah. like so was bad. Was bad for, and I'm still I'm still so scared of calling current time millis, um, and it probably shouldn't be anymore. No, but like I none of the docs, the docs don't guarantee not, that it's monotonic. Yeah, it's uh, not guaranteed. Uh, pretty sure it's guaranteed monotonic. No, nano time is not. How how about nano time? Yeah, yeah, nano time is definitely. Well, that's the thing is, I believe nano time yeah. is has been fixed to be, but it's still neither one of them is docked as being monotonically increasing. Nano time used to be horrific because like. Depending on which CPU core you queried it on, you yeah. get wildly different values. Right. Like off off by more than makes any sense. Yes. I but think they, they've the, changed the spec on current time millis like in 2020. That oh, late? Like, oh, but the spec, the implementation has to have been monotonic for much longer than that. Benchmarking games in the early mid 2000, before 2010, it was monotonic reliably on all the hardware I ever benchmarked on. And nano, even if the hardware clock jumped backwards, I'm sorry. Or you, did you? If the hardware hardware clock jumped back, did you? Um, if you change it out, or you relied on the operating system to do that? Yeah. If you if you change the time on the operating system, yeah, current time millis would fuck around. We went to the went to the OS, but we got reliable numbers out of the OS for many many years. So wasn't it that nano time resolution was a hundred nanoseconds? You no, nano time. Nano time is is the a clock tick register on mm -hmm. x eighty six. It's whatever the count t count or count register, which for a time was you know one tick per tick. Except turbo boost and power save mode and things like that would have it scale faster, and then they were not synchronized between cores. So two guys would be increasing, you know, one go faster than the other by a little bit or a lot or whatever. And then after a day, they'd be like hugely off, just like Mark was saying, he's like ridiculous numbers. Right. And so if you're trying to measure something with nano time and your thread swaps cores yeah. during that measurement, you get weird, like negative time. Yeah. I always wrap those in a, in a sensible check and throw it away. If, if, it did how, how, if it did out of what I considered out of bounds, I just said, try again. How, how do they fix it? 
how do you fix it nowadays? So nano time. Yeah, it's nano time has the hard the hardware clocks are synchronized now. For yeah. Nano time. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. x eighty six of a more modern generation that count is hardware synchronized and on something that's not tied to clock frequency, but the spec says nothing. Yeah, and it's still the the value is arbitrary, right? Like nano time has no correlation to wall clock time. No, no. and I think basically it's how long has your CPU been up? Um, oh. But so you can get things like you can you can experience clock rollover very easily. Oh, so yeah. also saying like yeah. later is greater than prior is not meaningful, which yeah. is nothing like so my my fixed clock yeah. thing says like this is it's the time since the the JVM started. Yeah, like so as long as as long as the JVM's uptime isn't a uh, <laughs> three hundred years, we're, we're fine. So now on the on the issue of clock, one more story that the Azul hardware had a synchronous counter because they were all worried about getting the current time milli, current time whatever correct all the way around. So they were synchronous to the clock cycle across all 800 cores. And roughly, I was told that roughly 50% of the die area was the clock. That it was this giant phase lock loop with huge, I don't know, capacitor, inductor, whatever, that in order to every, all cores across everything, you know, it was multiple boards in a, in a fridge box, to sync them, it was the huge chunk of area was tied up in the clock. I've I, been told that's true with x86 also, that the ticks counter yeah. uses more area than you think it does. Right. And it's not... And it's not transistors, it's, it's wires. It's wires. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. The cost of time. Time, time, time is annoying. But yeah, there was one interesting yes, story we ran the into where... Getting more We're going to get these details slightly wrong because it happened to someone else and I'm retelling the story, but it was, we had the Zen hypervisor stuff set wrong mm. so that when one VM was running tests and as part of its test, it kept setting the clock to a bunch of different times. <laughs> but because we hadn't set the hypervisor correctly, it was actually changing the board clock which meant all of the other VMs were experiencing the time jumping around because it happened to have been scheduled on the same box as right. one of these boxes that right. was doing a bunch of tests right. that required pretending a bunch of time. We had. A, I um, seem to recall too that I, like query, some, querying the time has different costs on different hardware and different OSs, and like reading it under a hypervisor uh -huh. has such a penalty, which is one of the reasons for this. Like, let's have a background thread right. that pays all the costs. This, we the second one that was a fun story with that is we built this whole like making sure things work historically over time testing stuff at Twitter. And then we had this moment where a bunch of stuff that was relying on this test infrastructure, like everything freaked out all of the sudden. And, you know, of our 1200 microservices at the time, like 1100 of them were failing tests and we couldn't deploy anything. And it turns out that the date that had been picked as a timestamp in the future that was 10 years after the test was written passed. There you go. And suddenly the whole testing infrastructure failed out because get timestamp future was never turning a timestamp that was in the past. I, I, I had a URL test like that that tested for some invalid URL, which was like, you know, dub, 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 this URL will never exist. And eventually that URL existed and that stuff started failing. Okay, <laughs> okay fine. Uh, this URL yeah. does not exist.com. What is that? Yeah, basically, yeah. exist.com. I had a test being uh, benchmark thing being get uh, nano time, which was great for whatever I was using it for, except I was calling it, you know, whatever billion times a second on a large multi core, big, big ass server thing, followed by somebody ran it under a hypervisor who decided that nano time should be monotonically increasing. And the cost to get nano time was 100x larger than it had been. And so my billion times a second became 100 billion cost a second. And that was, that was you know, a big fraction of the benchmark. Like, Oops, we slowed down by 10x on a hypervisor. What the hell? Yep. Fine. All right. Now I have two Levos, neither one of which can talk. Excellent. This URL does not exist.com does in fact resolve. Yes. And Somebody since probably the test started breaking. All your possible URLs. And if they exist, they go and log them and then they see if that you want to buy it back from them. 
I forget what alternate fake URL I put in. Like, like I think I put it. my name in it or something too. Like, there you go. There you go. Yeah, I tried to get my name, which I thought was pretty unique, and somebody had already grabbed my name. So I, so I have. Very I was very happy to be like early adopter of Gmail and get get my name before anyone else there got go. my name. There you go. Uh, I was so mad. Gmail came out on April first. On May first, I was making my account. One month later, and my name was gone. Was like, okay. Here we go. Oh, this person's not existed. <laughs> that could go into the links. We could all chase that link and see what it says. It might not be safe for work, though. I don't know. So it's fine. Uh, ch changing gears. Uh, what, yeah. what about chapter sixteen constructors? I threw in constructors. I'm very happy, very proud of my constructors. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if I should be, but I am. Let me let me figure out a good sharing here. Uh, how about this guy? How about this guy? Da 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 da, da. no. New view. Got why to hide these things? So ridiculous. View. Current view 150. How about we shrink a little? Is this like reasonable? I don't know if this is what you want to see. This is me finding fuzzer test cases. So new and improved in chapter 16 here is uh Bang for final fields, multi assignments, multi declarations. So X is final and Y is not. And constructors. Here is a sample. Here's a declaration. X is a final field. Here's a new X. He has a constructor where he assigns X. Here's another constructor where X gets an initial default value, but it's just overridden in the constructor, and that's fine. That's point. Here is a little more exciting. This is a, a leftover test from chapter 13. I make a linked list of I's where it has a nullable next field. And then here in the constructor, I set the next to the old head and I to whatever the argument and decrement and run in a loop. And it builds a linked list of length n. But the constructor body uh can run any amount of code that you like and if you assign the field variables you do and if you're a field variable that's final or has to be not null you must get assigned and otherwise you can put anything you want in the constructor body it's just like a java or c plus plus constructor except it's not in a constructor named function it's just like in java you put the constructors field initializer scattered around Arbitrary expressions can be put in the Arbitrary expressions. I don't have a fun example lying around. Uh, where did arg come from? Where did what? Oh, arg. You seem to be default. using a variable arg that didn't get yeah, defined anywhere. You can imagine that this that this entire thing is always wrapped in this. I'm running main here. It takes an int named arg. At some point, it will have a string array instead. But the the whole the whole expression here is basically wrapped in main. Does that make sense? That makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm reorganizing, reorganizing Windows here. So so this is like. Oops. So oh, I hate editing IntelliJ. What happened to Matt? Didn't I have Matt in there? He dropped. But now I could, in theory, say something like. Uh, Mm -hmm. This is me doing live demos. So, you know, while arg is uh, less than 10, you know, i is equal to i plus arg. We'll, we'll just, I, I'm just making up junk code here. Like th this should all just work. Or you could do this. Or you could do, um, I mean, you could count primes or whatever you want to do here. So in theory, this compiles. Of course, it will fail the test because you know, the output will be wrong. And he says, no, I had an error. Look at that. Well, I don't want to debug it now. 
on the constructor. Ah, well, you go. So oh, in theory, so that should work, but I found myself a new test case. So there you go. Yeah. What, 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 what do you need to add in order to support constructors from the previous chapters? Is there something new or? Yeah, but it's nothing hugely new. That was the fun part. It was actually quite modest. Um, the big piece is harsh block. So here I am in allocation. So, so really, I mean, your parse primary, which got a chunk for new, which got big. So I broke the new chunk out into its own thing. So you're at the pretty far down the leaf of the recursive descent parser, and you're, you're parsing something. So parse a new. This is before I'm expecting new of a type, of an array. That's from chapter 15. It's all good. Um, you have to do something I can do a new on. You can't do a new float. Here I get the initial default initializers, because you can have non-trivial default initializers, which are necessary if you have final fields you want to set in the beginning of time, you can do that. Then I look for a constructor. And if I have one, I call parse block. That's the new thing. So I make a scope and I parse the block. Now that I have a scope, I have to go walk the scope and grab, that's going to be having a new struct here. And then if I had a constructor, I'd pop my scope. So new struct is like, hey, I walked the scope. I look for fields and I initialize all your fields. So mostly what used to be here was uh, nothing. You were not allowed to do anything. And you had to initialize all your fields afterwards. But what really it meant was I couldn't have either final fields or the, the, the driver of this was I couldn't have non-zero, non-null fields. So if I wanted to have a, a not null thing, it was always initialized to null, which is you know bad for a not null thing. And then you had to set it and you're only allowed to set it to not null, that's great. But with complicated enough expressions, you could basically escape the not null, uh, object of the not null field out when I wouldn't be aware that it was not null. And then you could grab things out of it. And uh, and I hit test cases that would blow up in like the evaluator where I'm not, I'm, I'm on purpose by design. You're not supposed to go throw null pointer exceptions in this language. You mm -hmm. cannot make a null pointer exception happen in a valid program. So do we have um, a default constructor, an empty constructor? Yeah, yeah the empty general? constructor just fills you with null or zero. Mm. It just, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so this is a declaration um, I didn't do an empty constructor in this example. Here's Can an I provide a function that will generate the default, or the default just has to be an instance of that value at compile time? I'm sorry, like you're talking about here. If I you have a thing that's not line. nullable, I would like to instantiate a struct with a not nullable int in it. Okay, not I can't do it with ints, I can do it with, with pointers. Sure. Right, so I have to have this. So if I get rid of the question mark, I have to. But assign... if it's a pointer, then isn't it inherently nullable? Uh, no, only if the question mark's on it. Okay. Like it this, it's not point. nullable. And mm -hmm. I must initialize it here in the declaration or here in the new with a value that is not null. Mm -hmm. And this always... is a cyclic reference with a not null. I can't make an initial value. So this program never compiles because you can't make an initial not nullable. There's no, there's no saving that one. Let me see if I have some other examples lying around. It can look. live as a unassigned, but can never escape as yeah. unassigned. Yeah, let's go to the doc if we're going to explore examples here. Uh, da, 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 da. So if it's not nullable, you cannot terminate it. So you cannot, uh, as a termination of the list, send, just set it to null. So you'd have to have some... Sure. That was one of the recent changes to Java, right? Is that they're introducing non-nullable types that have to be set to something even before you call the super constructor. Hmm. Super is not allowed to see a not nullable type in a null state. Hmm. Oh, even before the super. Okay, I'm not right. I don't have, any, don't have any inheritance going on here. So someone was saying that it was more complicated than normal because allowing you to call the code that initialized things before calling super was changed things, but I don't really understand how or why running code before calling super is any different than running code after calling super. 
Initialize, maybe. Can you increase the, the font a little bit? Uh, uh, I can. Hmm. How about that? That's, yeah, that's too readable. So, like, here is a person whose mm -hmm. string name must be initialized. You can't get away without initializing it. Mm. And then here is the same person with, uh, you are allowed to be no name, and then you get a fault, default free null initialization. Mm. And so then, if uh, it's a noble, and when, okay. Uh, if it's a noble, when you see a new new person, the the name would be automatically initialized to null, or if it's noble, if you don't assign anything, it gets initialized to null. Yeah, mm -hmm. in the constructor body, you can do whatever you want with the fields, mm -hmm. uh, finals. Yeah, because you have to say new person, yeah. and then on the first example, that is correct. That is the same as as with or without the params. So, so this is functionally identical to, uh, oops, where'd my cursor go here? How about now? I, this is not, it's not VS code. It's not VS. And because it's named arguments, you can just leave out whatever. Yeah, so, so both, arguments. The, these are both an error on the original person because uh, no prints or no, no curlies is amounts to no fields. So there's no curlies is a shortcut for having curlies with nothing in it. Right. Mm -hmm. And under this person, you have to have a name assigned, must assign a name. And then you could have another class. It's like anonymous person that may or may not have a name. Yes. That's a better, that's a better example than what I had done here. Yes. Well, you had just redefined a person. I think it's worth giving it a separate name for example purposes. So a non-person may not have a name. Yeah. 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 And then you have final fields on them, which you know. I'm going to give you. And this a, is all simple, right? This is all simple, yeah. AA has very similar things for a lot of this with some different syntax. Like AA doesn't have to have types, but it's also not functional. And this is way more functional, but you have to have types because I'm screwing around with type inference for too long. So under under this model of the world, I have to have a UUID must be assigned at some point. Right. So under the under the on a non-person, I still need a UUID. So if I come down here and I say, these two are errors, whoa, come back, hello. Oh, you're not either Emacs or anything I see. Wow, okay, yes, fine, hang on. Yeah, he's, it's, it's a bad error, editor. So this was your example, I moved up. Now here's now do an anonymous person guy. We're gonna say a, a non-person has to have a UUID, but it doesn't have to have a name. So that one's okay because I have a I have a, a name, and I can also add a name, and then I can claim you know if I fail the above, it's an error. Yeah, and then there's arrays. So arrays, so the question mark, so the question here is where do you associate the question mark? The question mark goes with the T on the left. And I don't, I, and I, in order to be consistent, I demand a question mark uh, on an array that is of a reference type. So this is valid, uh, but a uh, uh, person like this invalid because the array is full of nulls. So in my mind, person question mark array should mean that you can have not allocated the array yet. No, that's the that's the next. Why one. is it an array of nullables rather than a nullable yeah, of array? That's 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 the 
that's the C, C++ const, uh, you know, this, that, and the other. Where, where's the pointer go? Const star, const star, const. Where's the const? Where's the pointer? So the pointers, the question mark is after the whole type. So if I have a, an array that is not yet initialized, I have to put it there. So, so here I have a struct of persons, and it's going to contain a, 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 a person question mark array. Now, do I need to have it filled in originally always or not? So this is my, uh, my PS, my collection of persons. Here I claim it must be set. versus a question mark person, which is I lazily fill it in. Right, so the other version of that is Does that make more sense? You could, the first you one could, is an array that elements of the array can can be null. You read it left to right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, let me think about how, how you want to read it out loud here. Um, I mean, I agree that one of those question marks should be about whether the whole thing can be a null, and the other one should be about whether the values inside the type can be null. Right. Mm -hmm. So what what we ended but up. But it's with... enough to make me want to move the syntax to put the type in the braces, because then I think it's more clear what's going on. Oh. Yeah, we could argue that. Did we even, are we, we went back and forth on a bunch of things. We ended up with the question mark where it is. We started out with, by not having the question mark on the array, on the person question mark, this one. We started out with this syntax and decided it was inconsistent because it demanded an array of persons, but of course you had none, it was filled with nulls. So we went ahead and put the question mark, required the question mark. Now, putting the brackets around the person question mark, I actually kind of liked. Um, I, I could go that way as well. And for exactly the reason you're talking about. To my mind, in order to make this make sense with the grouping, I almost want to force parentheses and be like this is a nullable person and it's an array of them well you have to have the question mark because the array is going to be nulls nullable persons the array will be nulls i'm not going to pre-construct all the persons in the array not too much to delve in, into the syntax but once you understood what question mark means after some identifier you you can figure out what can be nullable and what cannot Okay. Oh, sorry, Cliff, was one of the options the square brackets around the type is the way that you specify an array type? Mm -hmm. um, it is not, but we could argue that that's a better syntax. Yeah, it's, I mean, it, it, it's totally bizarre at first glance, but then it makes perfect sense, right? Like, right. Yeah, that's how you should say an array of person. It's an array of... Person. Yeah, it's an array of person. The persons are in the array. Yeah, yeah that's like beautiful. Oh. I mean, you oh. know, too much prior art saying otherwise, but... You well, should be the on the be... Sea of Nodes thread on Coffee Club and have these discussions because this discussion came like... and went, and I don't remember why we chose one or the other. I can go find the thread. Somebody want to dig through the Sea of Nodes thread and go back uh, uh, weeks, right. not months, but weeks. So to me, I don't think it should have to be nullable necessarily if you initialize it. Okay, I don't have any uh, any reasonable initialization syntax right now. So, ah, so the, okay. the reasonable initialization is I take a function, it's given an element number and returns a person, and I fill the array by by iterating over it. So there is a there's a reasonable syntax here for the constructor, but so, I don't have it right now. Um, just uh, in reference to this uh, square brackets around the type yeah. for the array. Yeah. Um, would you ever want to have an actual array of types? I'm not uh, doing so array of types. You're, um, you'll never do, do an array uh, of types? No, but you might have a reflective type thing that was just a normal object in the language, and then it follows the normal object rules. Well, I'm just wondering if uh, you end up with an ambiguity or you exclude the ability to ever have 
an array containing the nullable person type because yeah. you've already defined this. As and I, a, already, I already have an array of nullable persons. That's this syntax with the- No, sort of sorry, not an array of nullable persons, but an array of the type nullable person. Yeah, so I have no types as first class citizens in the language. Uh -huh. This is by design. I can give you a reflective type of just same as Java. There are no that's types just a type of info classes. object that describes a type. It's not the type itself. Yeah, exactly. Can I use one of those to instantiate a type? I don't have such a thing, and I'm not super excited to go go there. We could go there, but first I would add functions, some syntactic sugar to make writing just standard like for loops and everyday code easier. Then code gen. This is this is not a language design. This is a how to write a compiler. Now, the parser and the type semantics, I'm willing to have fun discussions. These are fun discussions. And and I like the square brackets around. I think we went back and forth and we had we found like some ambiguity that we like didn't like. We backed away from the square brackets around. And I don't remember now what the ambiguity is. Oh, I remember. do do a do a two-dimensional array. Do a three-dimensional array of ints. Right. So let me let me throw down a three-dimensional array of ints here with square brackets. So, so either way. So so int one, two, three. Um, what is this? This is my 3D space. This is a canvas, whatever. Or, yeah, exactly. Now you got it. Somebody already wrote it already. Yeah, nah, 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 nah. Oops. Nut nut nut. Canvas. Okay. Now, which of those looks better? This is like, everyone is like, ooh, I like Persian query. Yes, yeah, one-dimensional arrays, it looks great. Here's a three-dimensional array. Yeah, maybe, maybe. I think it's I mean, also right. I mean, it's an array, an array, an array of ints, right? To and me, it, that makes sense. It's fine, but it implies a level of raggedness. Um. So there's a separate thing here. And that's, I first came in and said, let's do... C Fortran flavored arrays that are all known compatible, multi-dimensions known compatible. That would be another version like this of X, Y, Z or something. And, and, and people said, no, 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 be consistent like Java and have a ragged. Okay, so now let's, having said that, the implementation of multi-dimensional arrays can be made at runtime to have a C-like layout with an, a Java-like semantics. Both at the same time. Um, and, and all that means is when you make a multi-dimensional array, you make all dimensions at once. They're guaranteed laid out sequentially in memory so you can do the fast, efficient, cross-dimensional math. And also they have object headers in between so you can get at the in-between objects, but you can't break the rigid structure. You cannot turn it into a ragged array. So under that model, I can get you both Java semantics and C performance on arrays for multidimensional arrays. And you're not allowed to break the layout. Uh, and if it's a garbage collected language, he just moves the whole wad as a single unit. And then I can actually let you break the semantics with a bunch of runtime support that says it can be ragged. If it is, the optimizer just gives up on you and you get shitty code. It works, but it's shitty. And right. if it's not ragged, uh, he'll do. He can. He he is allowed to do register tiling and register blocking and all cache blocking. Do all the fancy shit for high speed multi dimensional arrays. Right. The as if rule do... always applies. I would say on the top one, I have expressed something ragged, and on my second one, where I say no, no, I want my array, but I specifically want my array to be three by three by three. Um. I, now, I need a yeah, go turn it into one no, 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 no. I, I single a, allocation. I need... I need a length that's an arbitrary expression. So, so a three by three by three give, this is not high. So the type first, I'm make a new. So you've tried to do an allocation as well. So let's make a new of this triple array. Now, where do I put the length? That's the type. So the, the other form of types is, of news is always new type. Yeah, that's what I was doing with the semicolon syntax. Yeah, yeah, okay, fine. So My length be, is, in I, this I, case, three. I need a new in front. My new is my keyword that says you're not declaring a new type, you're allocating a new uh, allocating new object of a specific type. And then I don't need the new other than that's the type. So I do need the type. And then here's your, and these are arbitrary expressions. So a three of E0, E1, E2, and these can be anything that fits the expression model. 
that, I mean, I'm not, I'm not happy with this particular form either. Tensor equals, yeah, exactly, exactly. I have a 3D thing here. And is there a nicer syntax for doing this kind of thing? I think, Matt, you had an opinion about multidimensional This is where we, we stalled out on the multidimensional thing. And in the sea of nodes thread, we 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 choked on this. And we're like, uh, uh, and then I said, okay, do the easy thing. Let's get it working. We can argue fine details after a while. Right there to the right of the, of the slash slash is how you would write it in Java. And in Fortran, you'd have E0 comma E1 comma E2. I mean, probably round braces too, like that. I like the squares for arrays. That's great. Don't do rounds. What? What I what I find nice about the, the you know the the declare the syntax where you declare it with the brackets on either side yeah. is that it becomes very similar to generics, right? Like a list of T versus and you know, you get the same sort of thing. So if you look at how would you allocate a three dimensional list of T, like write that and then replace list angle bracket with square bracket, and that should be the answer. Um you, you mean well, here, like if we wrote, I mean, like if we wrote it in Java, right? If we were going to create a three-dimensional array list, oh, uh, how can we'll we... just do it, do it with array list for now, and then we can go back and replace. Uh, this is not symmetric with. I can't do it in, in Java because I don't know how to do the thing. I so, said so. Okay, so in Java... well, like new new array list of int. And then passing in the capacity, right? Okay, now multi-dimensional. So that right. Would be... So now would be another <laughs> surround that entire. Yeah, exactly. But where is yeah, and then, an array and list then of an array more. list of an array list of an so that... Actually, thinking out loud now, I would have expected to do this in a comma, with a comma inside the angle brackets, and do it in a comma inside the square brackets too. So let me like else write to... this. I don't know what if, you're saying. If you take the first syntax, when you have bracket, 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 int. Yes. The first line. Yeah. Yeah. Duplicate this line. And inside the square brackets, when you have an int, inside the square brackets, when yeah. you have an int, just type, com, keep the int. No, don't, don't remove Wait, the somebody brackets. Somebody else is editing at me too, so I'm stopping. So let oh. only one person edit that line at a time. Yeah, that that's kind of what I was thinking of. Yeah, maybe you don't even need separate brackets. I liked having the three brackets on the new to match the type. Like up to now, after I say new, I put a type in. It's a standard type parse. Just give me a type. Except for arrays where I eat the whole type, except for the last dimension where I take a square bracket and length. So uh, let me show you the the while you're doing while someone's editing here, I'll show you what what goes on with simple for arrays, which right. I'll do up here. But in my mind, this syntax implies dense. This syntax implies ragged. When I see this. I think I've got a list of lists of lists of ints. When I see this, I think I'm doing only math and no pointer lookups to find the thing that is at the index. Now, the as if rule applies. You could certainly implement either in the other way, but. Well, this gets into a, a whole different, a, a different multi dimensional array syntax that doesn't have three square brackets for a 3D array, it's like more like a Fortran style where you start listing dimensions. And then you list your, your expressions for filling in. So I wrote above how you get the parse semantics for three-dimensional arrays and simple right now. I get a two-dimensional type, and then I parse the extra dimension. Um, but to get a Fortran style, and oh, geez, this must be Aaron. Aaron, your spelling is more atrocious than anyone else. I'm, mine's bad, but yours is worse. Um, and it's something like this. I mean, Fortran wouldn't do it that way, but you know, they'd say you had to start with the capital I or something to be an it. But 
somewhere you put an int followed by commas. So I would say more tram, an array style that was three dimensional. So that's the number of dimensions. No, I was do commas. So you can't have dynamic dimension counts. This spelling is very creative. Every time yes. I filled out one of those anonymous manager surveys things, the manager talked to me about it afterward and was like, ah, I noticed you said this. That your spelling is creative? Hmm? It, it just meant that anonymous feedback was not a thing. <laughs> oh, gotcha. Uh huh. Because I would fill out the anonymous survey, and like two days later, they'd be like, So I was reading your anonymous feedback, and I was thinking, uh -huh. Yeah. So you, you have a unique, a unique writing style. You were, you were found out by your unique writing style. Excellent. Uh, so there is a Fortran E. For training style. Um, so this is where we bogged down and simple and I backed off and I said, all right, it's going to be Java style, how you write it. Fine, done. But, I, you know, putting the brackets with the person question mark inside the brackets look darn pretty on one dimension. I think I like the version with the commas all the way fall inside the brackets. I'm not even, I'm not even sure if a semicolon is needed, to be honest. Because you can't gonna see that it's a different type of expression anyway. The semicolon? Yeah, oh, I don't, I'm not sure if it's needed. Is what I'm saying. Uh, so just put the types and the values of the dimensions inside the br square brackets. The, I think I let, this reads the cleanest to me. The the two two ones say tenths are equal. There's a top one that has semicolons inside. Oh, there is a Fortran style with a semicolon in style. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh huh. So I, I think this one is reads the cleanest. Let me let me take this one. Here's one with yeah, new array of ints with dimensions C zero, E one, E two. So you can read it left to right, and it's right. pretty clean. And because you have multiple fields with a comma, you don't need multiple square brackets to disambiguate that you have multiple dimensions because that's okay. kind of obvious. Yeah, that already. full of commas, right? The commas. Mm -hmm. Tell me the dimension count. I'm okay with the commas telling me dimension count. That's that's partial. But you also have to remember to include the question marks. Um, only for oh, um, only if you're making a ragged. Okay, so hang on. So in the land of non-ragged, you get a question mark only on the actual final element buried inside. Yeah. In the ragged array version of the world, we can go back to like I'm doing in simple right now. Same as Java. Exactly same as Java. Hey, this this allows ragged, and honestly, I think the multi-dimensional ragged scenario is fairly uncommon. Like, how many people know you've done multi-dimensions? Yeah, I mean, at this point, I think you should use a specific type like array list or something if you are doing ragged. But by default, the default, the cleanest syntax for array should always means dense array, because yeah. that's that's the useful kind of multi-dimensional array. Yes. And so I, I optimize agree. for the common path is what I would say. Yeah, optimize for that makes a lot of sense. So if you're multidimensional, you're dense. You don't get to set the inner arrays. They are all built on, on construction. You must give all dimensions at once, and the whole array is populated immediately at its full size. That gives us two different array syntaxes essentially. And then uh if you're a one-dimensional, it's ambiguous which one, it doesn't matter. They all have the same behavior. And if you're multi, yeah, dense or switch to a, an array list style. Like I don't have an array list right now, but you know, it's it'll it'll come. Now that I have constructors on my on my objects, it's it's a short jump to I have functions inside the constructor, and oh, the constructor is really a class object. So I'm very close to being a class object. And, and Cliff, going back to array list, I wrote in the what I was trying to get at with trying to follow its style to the last the last line there. Don't you need three sizes oh. in that? Yes. Yeah. E zero, missing... one, and two. In your array list version, that says array list has the word array list. Yeah, array sorry, list, yeah, array list. yeah, yeah. This would have been. Uh huh. Where do you put your sizes? Yeah, like. Oh, you I mean, have a... now, now it's not Java anymore. But then I'm proposing, well, then this would be the the natural equivalent. That was my question. Um, what is the actual Java syntax for that? Well, yeah. the Java array list doesn't have a, I mean, it has a capacity. So this, in Java, you you could do that, right? Or you could say, you know, now we have a capacity for our outer list, but we don't have anything in our inner list. You'd have to actually have to, call setters. 
Yeah. So, you, but you, using using it as a like, since it's a different language, we're like, okay, so yeah. three dimensional you, array. So you can do all this. the array constructor passing your three. No, no, you, you can do this by doing the evil. Yeah. Thing here, right? So you can put a capacity yes. in. And I believe you can put anything you want here, and it's like an anonymous inner class that extends a ray list that has yeah, it's it's a it's an anonymous constructor right there. So this can right. be a lambda that fills the inner dimensions. But yeah. it's 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 like yeah, it's 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 terrific. But taking that as inspiration, like then yeah, look at the next right. line, right? Like, like that's not, I mean, I don't think that's bad for multi-dimensional arrays. I think it's quite readable for a one-dimensional array. It'd be a little sad to not put the number in the square brackets, but it's also like kind of wrong to put the number in the square brackets. Well, this this what we've come down to in this discussion right now that I kind of like is we have two different arrays. We have a one dimensional array where the length goes in the square brackets, but in the type, the type goes in the square brackets. I think. Ooh, that's not going to work on the one dimensional array either. Oh crap! And then on the multi dimensional array, it's just dense by default. You can't do anything. But if you're in the one dimensional case, you you have to say new person bracket length. But the type is bracket person, not person bracket. So I'm I'm back to being, you know, bracket person looks sweet, except I can't allocate one. This would be I'm going up a block here. I want to make a new array of person. New person question mark array. Where's the length go? After the closing square bracket parentheses. Yeah, but then then I then I lose right. You lose the you lose the nice syntax of you know person question mark bracket length. Yes. Is it is it? I, I don't know. Like what I like about the the new like square bracket surrounding the type is that it's the type is know, it's clearer, right? Yeah, the type, like the, right, the and so great. like yeah. The so the and you know, so the I'd worry less about the allocation point than all the places we're going to refer to it. And I don't think the allocation point looks wrong either. It's just we're so used to being able to like just sh shove the size in the square brackets. But that that's honestly weird if you think about it. Like like why is that the way when everything else you pass it in as a parameter? Like this one place we treat it very differently. Yeah, I like the version of the comma still actually inside the brackets. Yeah, inside why parenthesis rather than just. It's the second parameter. The first yeah. parameter is the type. The second parameter is the length. No that commas and parameters. Me. No, no commas and no. It's not no commas and types. Like imagine uh, I have a, a, a an anonymous function syntax, and the type is an array of anonymous functions. I'm, I'm building a calculator full of anonymous functions. I have to have an anonymous function syntax, but that probably doesn't have that won't be ambiguous with the trailing comma, so it's not a problem. Yeah, semicolon would be the other one instead of a comma. But the only weirdness here is that the square bracket has a type followed by an expression in the square brackets. Like the outer square bracket is that the right hand side square bracket is part of the type per se, kind of. Like I don't have a. That's where it, type it should look like a constructor, right? Like we're calling the constructor for the type, right? We should have it look like a constructor call and have yeah, parentheses. Yeah, then, then, then you right, and then you get into this where the. Arrays have a and you don't and you don't need the the curly yeah. brace dot 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 in it stuff right like yeah well the the goal of the curly brace dot 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 in it is also to say so oh, if you wanted to set the content uh -huh, I want to fill my yeah. array I want to allocate yeah. and fill right. in one step. if it's not nullable yeah I want to be able to specify yeah. either populate the whole array with this one default or do something right. mathy it, there's like in the land of real live. HBC coding things where people do multi-dimensional arrays, numerical math, you don't do these initialize the whole array all at once things, hardly ever. You need a space for this working and you have a space for that source and you walk, walk these piles of giant data and yeah. you do something complicated I mean, to build. Constructor, well, constructor usually what I've seen is just is you, a... Go ahead. Usually what I've seen is you logically fill it all with zeros, but you don't actually fill it all with zeros. Yeah, and, but that's the optimizer's job. You said new, I got a thing full of zeros. Okay, in, in, logically. Yeah, now the I mean, optimizer says, hey, it's a complete stomp. I don't have to pre-zero, whatever. Constructor right. for this array is basically syntactic sugar for mmap call. And you don't need yeah. to actually have this memory map correspond to physical memory. It's just virtual memory that is logically zero. But that's all it is. Right. And then you start filling in when you write right. it. 
the thing I'm trying to avoid is having a, dis a sane default for every type. Some types simply don't have a sane default. What is a reasonable default date? There is no reasonable default date. Like, Current time willies. <laughs> 1970. <laughs> yes. The start of the, the Unix uh, epoch. <laughs> Which is zero. <laughs> There's your default. Ugh. Yeah, but the what is the default person? So, you know, Adam? No, right. John, John Doe. But how old is John Doe? No, never mind. Stop now. Um, he was born uh, January 1st, 1970. So, yeah, you know. clearly. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> this is like, wait, this is completely solvable. All right. And he's unemployed, makes no money. Gotcha. No problem. Yeah. He was also uh, born just off the coast of Africa at latitude zero, longitude zero. <laughs> These are all sensible. What are you talking about? Um, I don't know. As it stands right now, there's a constructor syntax and an array syntax. And I could be argued, that's a lot more work. Not a lot of work. That, that's, you know, it's another week or two, which I, I should be putting in no more than one a month. So that's another couple months. And I think I'd rather do functions. And we can come back around to alternative multidimensional array syntax. Because I do like the concept of a dense array, multidimensional array. If you have a multi-D array, by default, you're expecting it to be dense. And if you want to have a ragged multidimensional array, you actually really want an array of like array lists. As Matt said it right there. You're not, you're not doing. In my array. experience, when I want an array, I usually want dense. And when I want ragged, I usually want vectors. I don't actually want arrays because yeah. the reason it's ragged is because I have no idea what the lengths are. Yeah. Like I want to think right. 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 So you should have a vector of vectors of arrays, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. Something something along those lines. Okay, so I think you know, that's if I say settled. three dimensional array, then sure, I probably don't want ragged. But if I say vector of vector of vector of int, then yeah. I've said what I want. Yeah, you you've named already that you're ragged, and here's how. That's fine. And they can be question mark vectors or questionable vectors. All right. And now you know. The next next coding sessions work will be. What is anonymous function syntax. Speaking of byte shading and vectors, there has been an interesting discussion in Swift recently. They're actually proposing fixed size arrays, like suppose array of one dimensions, array of two dimensions, array of three dimensions, right? And someone raised an interesting point that it should actually be called vector. Because in math, where the name vector comes from, you have one dimensional vector, two dimensional vector, or three dimensional vector. So vector is the proper name for the fixed size array. Um, and is the dynamically sized array that should be called the array. I'm so not the opposite of C++. Yeah. The MATLAB vectors are dense and the MATLAB arrays are resizable things. Yeah, I'm not going Even to... though I'm used to the opposite convention in C++, I have to admit it's kind of made sense to me because indeed you, you don't really have vector that can grow and shrink in, the, in its dimensions in like math. Blasphemy. Now you sound like someone who studied math or physics. Exactly. I'm looking for principle of least surprise to a student learning compilers. It looks like C. Well, I mean, but those C. vectors, I, I don't know. I think I have been introduced to vectors in either middle school or high school, and I think that's relatively standard math. So you you learn very, very early about geometry, and you have a point, right? And then you have to prove something about triangles on that point, and then you introduce vectors. So that's Yeah, very but those early. math people don't even think the equal sign means assignment. They're kind of right, too. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's the Pascal, right? Colon equals that. Took yeah, I mean, I pronounce it Gets. I think it was yeah. either Dijkstra, maybe Dijkstra or Knuth that started okay. pronouncing this as Gets, and I stick to that. Too. Yes, exactly. <laughs> X equals X plus one. Incorrect. That's right. All right. No, we're writing a computer program. We're not writing math. There's an evaluation. There's not a proof. Um, I'm still tempted in the next language I write to make colon assignment everywhere so that equals can mean equals. But it definitely is some of your surprise budget. Yeah. Hey, well, that's that's very at, uh, yaml -y, so that works. I was looking at um, colon equals for update and equals for final assignment. 
which would turn into something closer to quality, but they don't like writing colon equals everywhere. Fine. All right, what else are we doing here? Are we are we we beaten the array syntax horse to death? So my last question that's related to that is so one way you can do nullable is to be like there's a none thing and then there's an actual thing. And the other way you can do options is to be like an option is really just a list that has a max size of 1. I'm going to shoot all the option people. So they quit bugging me. Um, I, I, I and I do like, wonder about that. Like, should you have vectors that have a max length constraint that you can set, and then just use lists as that, that seems like a very like, options because it's like you like want zero you're... or one of a thing. Here's the way we do. So, th but that's so specialized, to... right? Like, why why treat it as a list? I mean, yeah, like it it can function that way, but it, it feels like the wrong the wrong type. That's not a good answer. All right, I have this thing about uh, uh, you know mechanical sympathy is what the hardware does, and therefore that's the default cheap thing. And that's big size chunk of a memory for an array. If you wanna have a variant size thing, you need another field which says I have capacity and I have length. You do use something like that in C++, like in LLVM, you have this type vec small vector, yeah. Yeah. which can be stack allocated up to a given compile time size, yeah. say like five elements, and beyond that, you automatically allocate switch to the heap. So that is, that is pretty useful, because oftentimes you do have small number of elements, so you can keep it on the stack. But what, what, I'm, what I'm trying to point out here is it's a different type than a, a square bracket array of- Oh yeah, it's not, I wouldn't propose it as a default, yeah. Okay. So it's a, the default type for an array is a dense block of memory with a fixed length that's known by the runtime, which means as a length is gonna be, just like Java, it's gonna be part of the array, structure and memory. And then if you wanna have a variable size thing, you call it something else, and you add another field, which is the in-use length versus the max length, and it's a Java array list. But I would use a shorter name than Java array list. There you go. Yeah, that's one of the things that has bugged me in the past is it feels to me like the thing that I want most baked into the syntax of the language is dictionary and list. But I, I, the thing that I feel like should be most baked into the language is array and struct. So like, how do I do with this balance of, I want in my syntax to have dictionary and list be yeah. the most obvious thing that you reach for, even though those should be implemented in the standard library using struct and array that are actually baked into the language. Mm. So, I feel like what I want for my syntax and what I want for my language is right. I want dictionary and list to be in the standard library, but also in the syntax. So in the want... land of operator overloading, the obvious overload for square brackets and square bracket assign, I do this in AA, but you just do that. We could do this in simple. This is my land of, you know, syntax sugar. And that's a uh, uh, dict of key. And, and that's the square bracket one. And the other one is dict of P equals value. And then the, the operator here is square bracket. And the operator here is, you know, square bracket assign. These two syntaxes I claim could be reasonably done as an operator overloaded and maybe even just fixed for, uh, vec as a variable sized array and dictionary. And uh, and then you don't get to define the hash or whatever. You have to, they have to do something about what and it means to be a dictionary that you get the operator syntax. And you can kind of sidestep the entire dilemma. So Swift, for example, does built-in types like integers and floats as standard library types. And of course, then you have also syntax for integers and floats, but you also have hash tables or dictionaries as standard library types with core language syntax. Right. So you have so a it standard... doesn't have to be a dilemma in a sense. No, well, I'm, what I'm saying is I have a standard dictionary and a standard, I'm using the operator overloading. I have a standard dictionary in the language with a standard operator overload for it. I want a custom hash function and a custom equality. 
So how do I make the standard library take a custom quality check and custom hash? Like I, I can't change the implementation of it. It's going to be, uh, you know, bucket lists or open coding or closed addressing or whatever it's going to be. Um, that might be already a thing. Maybe I want to have a custom dictionary that does inline, uh, uh, inlines the objects. You know, the, the, the billion row challenge, you wanted a custom dictionary that had inlined the unique 16 bytes of the city name and eight bytes of weather data. And if you had an indirection in there, you lost compared to people who inlined. You just, it was just too slow compared to the inlining. So I can't, you know, if I, it, does this operator notion go to what kind of dictionary? Or just the fixed one in the library? Or you can do it on anything you want. Yeah, I want a highly flexibly typed. Okay. Now you I have just... to have operator overloading syntax baked into the language. And some things you can still customize even if you decide on the fixed implementation, like hash, hash function, that is something that could be made a protocol type class or trade, you name it. It doesn't have to influence the type of the array or the hash table itself. I just don't want to give up on the value and speed of working that I've seen in Python and JavaScript with the ability to just sort of throw down objects and arrays in JavaScript and lists and dicks and Pythons and worry about really pinning down types later. But then I often do later have this moment of like, okay, now I know exactly what fields are on here. I would really like to replace this dictionary with a struct and get the performance implications of the fact that I have replaced this dictionary with a struct. Preferably without having to change the syntax of my code all over the place. I, I, I don't like the normal operator. I don't have any good answer for what, what operator syntax looks like. How you declare I have this square bracket operator. Now, in, in AA, I worked on how to parse it reliably well on a recursive descent parser. There's a way to parse it reasonably well. Parse the using of it. But I want to do a declare that this class allows an operator syntax, operator overload syntax, and uh, and you have to declare that. I would, I would demand you have to declare that and have to know that you're using one of these guys. So when I see an operator syntax, I'm going to turn it into a function call of a known name against a known type. You know, basically, the upper square bracket is the actual name. The AA name puts underscores where you're going to put things that are value. So it puts an uh, underscore. This is the name. It is an anonymous function, which takes a dict and a key, and it's going to return me something of type stuff. And then the other one is a triple square dot dot equal, oops, square. <clears throat> so that whole wad of one, two, three, four, five, six characters is parsed as a single identifier in the language. And this is key and a value, and it doesn't update. Whatever update does, and then whatever update returns. So here I have a struct foo. He has some implementation internally, which may has a hidden table, I don't know. He has two functions. One is called under bracket, under bracket. And the other one is, you know, got an equals in it. And those are going to be parsed as infix style instead of, or trifix, whatever the hell the mixed mode, the three-way one is. But I can do that in the parser. I can spot those things and break them out and say, hey, you're actually calling the function this weird name. Okay, who has such a function? Hey, that's great, that's, that, that's the call. There you go. Is that a reasonable? And then this lets you define anything you want for a, a, a dictionary. And then immediately you throw a default one in the library, in the standard library that everyone gets an immediate pre dictionary. But you can write your own dictionary, have your own implementation of these things, including resizable vector arrays or whatever, array lists, syntax. Any value in that? Category. 
Sorry? And if I pass something in, as long as it was looking for something that matches the dictionary yeah. trait, like... The dictionary, right. So, so the dictionary here is a, of type foo, and it has a key of type whatever. I don't have any generics, right? So whatever foo is a fixed size from to, and it's going to return me a thing of type stuff. And I and I already declared that I have a stuff as a type. That's a you know bad type. So foo is a, is you know foo. I don't have any generics, so this is not correct. Is a key from foo key to stuff, right? It's all bad names all around. Um, and I'm not ready or thinking about putting generics in simple, but that's a that's an entirely different domain of compiler analysis, you know, type analysis and language spec as composed to just CodeJet. Now, simple is all about doing CodeJet. So as far as I'm concerned, I want to stall on generics maybe quite some time. So here's an operator overloading syntax, but I don't want to give you a generics for the dictionaries right now uh, because I don't want to deal with I mean, with Go it. managed to get pretty far before adding generics. There you go. So what did they do for a default dictionary? Did they have one? It went from string to object or object to object. They have I mean, a they did map have... type. Yeah, they had they had generics, but just just for maps, it was like built in. That was a special case, but they didn't have user definable generics. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, yeah. I mean, I could go there too for the same reason. I, I just don't want to deal with it right now, given the amount of time yeah. put on this effort. That might be worth copying to just be like, look, map and list are part of the language. Just to make Dick life dict and list are part of the language. Well, first I want to get code gen before I get super fancy, and then I have to have code. And somebody has to write code in simple and care. So there has to be a code generator that does something. You know, if I actually produce like a exe, maybe I grab Yasser's thing and linker and get an exe out. Then we can go to Godbolt on the web and have it, you know, puke out, run simple and puke out the binary. You can go compare what Clang versus simple does for writing some pieces of code that are sensible. But you have to actually write the code. Yeah, I claim simple's not not ready for writing code yet. So I don't have very many code samples. And then that means I don't need dictionaries and I don't need generics. Yield catch 22. I mean, that was always my test to a language was print to standard out, draw a pixel to the screen, send a packet. Yeah, no, that's a good, good set of things. Draw a pixel to screen. There you go. That, that's that's what I want to see to know that you have a reasonable standard library is that yeah. I can, yeah, I can print standard out, I can draw a pixel to the screen, and I can send it back in. Go 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 make Mandelbrot spin around on the screen for a while. See what they look like, yeah. Um yeah. Okay. Although frankly, the modern systems I've seen, as long as you can send and receive HTTP traffic. Maybe you don't need standard out or a pixel to the screen to be a useful language. Uh, I don't know. I do. I still do a lot of things where I get a, a command shell involved somewhere or terminal output. Like the debugger has a two string. Uh, you know, I'm over here in the, oh, I don't have it shared, whatever. You bring him IntelliJ and he stops in the middle and then I have a two string. And the two string produces a string, it's not standard out. So it's a little different, you're right. Yeah, standard out goes to like file system and this isn't. But for the debugger to hook it, he had to have some kind of sockets and TCP and I don't know what all, however he socketed himself up. Fancy IO, he had to have some kind of fancy IO. I've been doing this for a long time. I do not understand what debuggers do. I have done a few debuggers in my time and they're, they're kind of a bitch. There's, there's a, I did I did a small tiny embedded system where I ended up needing a, a kernel. I had to do the kernel, I had to do a kernel debugger. And kind of you debugging the kernel debugger with the kernel debugger was kind of a bitch, but it kind of sort of kind of worked, kind of sometimes. Uh, How did people in the fourth world debug? They just use print statements? Um, you know, print statements go a long way. The 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 kernel debugger debugging itself. One of the things was I you know initialized the the serial port as a UART thing and I had to debug my device driver to it, which is pretty trivial. 
And then, yeah, you spew all the registers out and you hook it up to a fucking VT100 emulator and you can get color and things out of it too, but it would just dump all the registers, dump the stack, some amount of stack anyhow. Kernel, the stack's kind of weird. <laughs> Not necessarily all right what you think it is. And, uh, you know, oh, I single stepped and it didn't. It went too far. So I'm going to set a breakpoint inside the debugger and see if I can stop the debugger and the debugger. And, well, here's the debugger puke on the stack and so on and so forth. <laughs> it's it's a bitch. Yes. Doing a debugger once just gives you great understanding of the low-level hardware interactions, though. It's worth it in your life if you ever do anything with these kind of systems to stop and go right. You know, get some little tiny Android, not Android, with the littlest thing, Arduino or something, Raspberry Pi. Go write a debugger. Not even a kernel debugger. Just go write a debugger. Worth it. Learn shit. Because that's the, that's the mode your compiler gets to work at. You know, you're talking about Java runtimes. It flips the stack rewriting. Well, your stack rewriting, same crap the debugger's doing. You're looking at. So I posted the syntax used in Swift. So it's just a column separating the type. So it's pretty much, it looks like a built-in type dictionary. You can have like a dictionary from int to string or a dictionary from string to string. And that in turn is implemented in the standard library. So you can kind of have both like so with this, syntax and implementation in the standard library. So this string colon string is a known special parse syntax that gets you a dictionary. Yep. With hashes, the guy on the left and keys, whatever his default hash and key is, and whatever the thing on the right is the payload. Yep. Okay. And is, you know, is it concurrent? It's not embedded. It's totally generic. So it's not an embedded system. It's not an embedded dictionary. It's, you're going to be pointers and dereferences, which is fine. It's it's a great it's a great until I get specialized super high performance cases. This kind of thing is a easy easy thing. Now that does mean that you you have reserved some funny syntax, which you have to live with for all time, like our array syntaxes from before. One of the things, by the way, going on here before is I had the new keyword. I don't actually need it right now, but if we change the array syntax too much, I do because I parse a type right now. And I can just say I'm looking for a type or I'm looking for a valid uh, variable name. But also if you if you go go to the Swift, uh, Swift collections, so this is a new library they introduced, right? And if you scroll down until you see ordered dictionary, it's ordered set, right here. So you see, so you can still introduce something new and you just need to know that the key type conforms to the hashable protocol. So the key will provide some function that knows how to hash it. So you can still customize it. Then the sentence I think still it's relatively lightweight for a newly added type. And again, this is a new library that was not existing in the core language, but it kind of works out. So, so order dictionary. And this is inferred to be from int to string. Right, because the elements are, are doing it. I don't have any type reference going on in simple right now, which is fine. Yeah, and um, to be fair, Swift type inference is non trivial. That is one of the things that contributes right. to the compiler. Well, as soon as you, right. Yeah, as soon as you have good type reference, you can do all kinds of other things. You can get, get away with all kinds of shortcuts. So, and then the other thing is that these things have a known order, they have a compare to in Java. They have an equality in Java and they have a hash, which they do for ints and strings, obviously, all these things are, but but you have to demand the left-hand side have be orderable, hashable, comparable, or equalitable, or whatever you want to call it, which is fine. Yeah, sure. But all he did here was he said, I made a type. So if I put a type name down, that's a new. In in simple, I could do that right now. If I see a type name, it's a new. And I also, I kind of like this assignment that they are doing just equals to and then straight up write the square brackets and the contents. Yeah, so so that's a, so let's go back to building an array contents in this style. And this is a dictionary contents, building array contents where you said new array and you wanted to put elements in. And what do you do? How do you, how do you specify um, where well, I guess we start a whole new section here? So I mean, doing ints to make life easier to begin with, 
int array, some i's is a new int of, here's a length, that's one of them. Somebody got to clone me an empty section. I'll, I'll go to a new section here. Yeah, thank you. And and the other the other question is where your ambiguity comes from, right? Equals new int array. And oh, but now I wanted to do something. I don't know. Where where do I get my my you know? Where do I get my elements in here? Let me let me do more inventive elements. So what's the right syntax for initializing on the spot that lets me get rid of new? It'd be nice to get rid of new. I'm very close to getting rid of new. It's not, not required. So, C language has an interesting choice. I mean, relatively new C, like C99. Yeah, I think it's at least C99 for struct initialization. And you can have struct containing arrays. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah, I should have put this later. Someone just yeah. moved this. Thing. Yeah, they probably put it up into the into the here. But my but... instinct for the literals is to do a very JSON like thing. So you can see, you basically put things in the. So that's since C ninety nine. Put things in the braces, and that works for like right. structs of right. regular types of arrays of structs. Just keep using the curly the, the braces. Well, here, all here's a... And I like you can use the names for this. Like you have this struct with second minute, hour, day, and Monday. You can still change the order of initialization. Yeah, the struct, the field, is not a problem. I do that in simple already, too. It's the array here for car C, C4 is still done with... So you initialize the first, uh, the element number 0 to 1, and then yeah. the remaining are default right. initialized with zero 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 by at using this moment. braces for your struct for your sorry your array initialization is being done with braces here is a eight of four and in i'm guessing it's here it's it's uh, uh braces and i'm but like you, you do need to have a default value for the type so those array members that you do not mention are zero initialized yeah the default is easy it's the i'm hoping to get square brackets i'm gonna go back to some proposed syntax for like this is allocating a thing and in here i would claim i want to do like make an int array but instead of being a length the comma means I'm filling in elements, but I have to name elements. Yeah, to... go back to go back to the example for Fred. Scroll down until you see Fred, like the name. May take a while. Yeah, you see here. And if you notice in Y, you can also write the square bracket index equals value of the element of the array at that index. And because each element itself is a struct, then you put the entries of that struct. Yeah, but I like the, the Java version where you just start putting structs one after another. Right, right. But if you want to reorder, maybe first you want to initialize index number 42, right. then you want to initialize element at index 7, then that's kind I, of... I, I claim I never want to reorder my arrays. And and this is just extra syntax. And I've lived many years without reordering my arrays. I don't, I don't care for adding this syntax. Most I'm trying to use square brackets for the array contents. Like the the car and the string punning here is fine. That's maybe maybe not. I don't know if I'll go there. But having the Y be a collection of well, here's the collection syntax. But I would claim I want an array syntax square brackets. And then here's a Y, I guess. And then here's another rewinding the zero with Y to being some other Y. I don't like that one. This one, if as long as you have a comma, I can dis disambiguate it. And you wrote my ints on the left instead of int array. Like, like here is this version of typing. There's another version of typing which says I put the type on the right with a colon instead of instead of the name. Um, that's an unrelated question. I've been using C style, but there is a style that says variable colon type. And then I'm looking for an array constructor syntax. So like I could demand that you could do inline array construction, 
but it, it immediately requires uh, a comma. And I have to be able to deduce the type of this expression to be the type of the array. That's probably dangerous. I probably can't do that. Like right now, I have a notion of persons and person right. arrays. So if you want to have a JSON-like structure on the right-hand side, oh, I don't know and you know the type on the left-hand side, You know, I've got my person that's got a name and a user ID and a list of phone numbers. Well, on the right side, I can just have a person in square brackets because I know that it's a person. I don't need you to tell me the type again. And because the person's name field I know is a string I can just put a string are, literal are you, there and because the person's phone numbers is a typing? list of strings you're, you're not typing you're talking out loud I'm not typing oh, okay so so I missed your example I was writing an example of here's an array that I possibly could tell you was a not null array of persons so without reference to what the type is on the left what is the type of this expression? Does it allow a null or not? Well, it doesn't have one at the moment. That one does. Uh, you know, maybe I could tell you it's a not null array. So that was that was my sorting out. Can I? Can I? What level type inference do I need to be able to pick out the syntax which starts with a square bracket, finds a comma in the middle, and therefore declares that instead of a length. It's an element of an array, and I'm going to finish out the array as starting. Like I would parse the square bracket, parse an arbitrary expression. It's not an integer expression, and it has a comma. Well, it has a comma, therefore, it's an array of things. Uh, start with a not null. It's not, uh, I wouldn't start with a null or not, because you can have nulls in the middle or not. If I need to allow nulls in this array, I don't like. I don't know how to do that unless I threw one in. If I have no nulls in here, I might default you and say it can't ever be null. Suck it up, Buttercup. Followed by that's the type of the expression, but the array itself uh, would have to be assigned to a not null variable. That's an interesting one. Right now, I don't have this choice for arrays themselves to say they can or can't allow a null. Because if you want to take an array that has no nulls in it, and you want to say it can never have a null, and then I assign it to a left-hand side variable which allows a null, nullable array, I have to change the type of the array, the original array, or I have to error you out and say, you can't do that because you, you'll, you'll lose precision. And, I'll, uh, and I have you an array. You could say whether it's on the left or whether it's on the right. You have to give me a type. Yeah, so on the right, I, I don't have a type. It's simple. Like, You're requiring people to type the types, right? Well, I'm looking for an array initialization syntax. If I require you to write the type, then the type on the right is, you know, person array. Okay, that's a person array. That's great. Now I want to initialize this person array. What's the syntax for initializing the person array? Well, there's the constructor syntax of Java constructors, C constructors. I'm using curlies for my constructor syntax. But suddenly I have a different constructor syntax. The constructor syntax is taking a list of elements or a collection of elements as opposed for an array as a constructor on an array. And then, the, you know, this gets into, ooh, I love my person array with the brackets like this. By the way, I posted the C99 example. And yeah. one of the examples where I think the indexes come in handy is this uh, matrix initialization for this matrix Y four by three. <laughs> When you want to initialize it to a very particular pattern, so yeah. that's much easier than just typing zero 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 one one one. I see. I would I would claim that as soon as you got sort of any size, I would like to see the repetitive pattern to know that I'm initializing as a triangular matrix, or I would have a function. I would put a function there that would do the triangular matrix initialization. That's but so much work. I would not <laughs> want to write that. <laughs> I it. No, I, I want to see this pattern. You have a triangular pattern on the right. 
I would love to see that grid pattern layout and say, oh, it's a three by three identity matrix because I'm but, doing. But you know what? But the indexes give you a pattern too because you can read out this index zero, zero, that's one, 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 that's one, two, zero, that's one. So then if it, is a, if it were an identity matrix, you would see this pattern zero, zero, one, one, two, two, for example. Yeah, I understand. But I'm, I'm still saying I, I'm not fond of this. You are welcome <laughs> Fair enough, to, go, enough. to go do that. And honestly, the syntax is not terrible in that style in the sense that it's a series of constructor likes where the left-hand side is a field, but the field name is square bracket, zero square bracket, as opposed to the field name being name or UUID or salary or age or something. Right. And it's kind of useful a, for a, the enumerations uh, because enumerations could be reordered so you could add some new enumerator yeah. or take it out, then it's also nice to have. Yeah, the, the, the enum one has a more appeal to me. I yeah, I had no of... idea that was valid, C99. It's pretty handy. I certainly do a lot of things where I have large enums. They have holes in them as well. And I do an array lookup of them. And I want to initialize the ones I have. And the holes could be holes. And I don't care what's in the hole. Although I'm not sure that's more readable than just the for loop that sets the diagonals. Uh-huh. That's what I'm thinking. Which the is for loop set clear what it's doing. Pretty, pretty obvious. Yeah. And if it's small enough, I'm totally okay writing out the grid pattern there longhand, just so your eyeball will spot it and see, oh, look, it's a diagonal in the grid pattern. Like I looked at your one, zero, one, bracket two equals one, this thing on the left, I did not spot that it was a, it was a diagonal. When I saw the thing on the right, instantly, instantly, oh, it's a diagonal, a diagonal matrix, great. Right. And, and and I knew, and I would claim that's the better answer then. It's easier to read. Maybe something like on the next line, because I mean, here you can at least read out this does is not a pattern because it's actually not an identity matrix. But again, if you read the indexes, you will see whether there is a pattern or not. Yeah. So you'll see this repeated coordinate. It's not, yeah, fine. Given the variable name Y, you could write that initializer just in C code right after Y array of four by three, somebody call it Y zero zero equals one, Y one one equals one, Y two zero equals one. I mean, pretty easy to, to just put a Y in front of the assignment and then it's valid syntax and all you saved was writing the array name. Eh, don't use giant array names. Just write it longhand. All right, I, I don't agree with every C99, not too surprising. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it gets there, it gets there, but that's like more syntax for syntax sakes. I don't want it. I'm still trying to figure out if I can get away with square brackets for type in the middle, one dimensional array, and you're initialized. In this syntax, if you, have, if you have already typed the square bracket person square bracket, then I think it is not a major typing from Sphinx to just elide the person in the initializer list, right? right. It would be like a lot simple, naive local type inference. It's not like a major type inference algorithm at this point. Right. <clears throat> um, just like Cliff, comma, Aaron. Right. Not, no, even sure, not even sure if you need a, well, unless, unless you want to use the names, right? Well, Right. So, so I actually, right now I do in my constructors, I do need the name equals. Um, well, that's name fairly colors. readable. That's fairly yeah, it readable. Is. yeah, it's fine. So I, I was shortcutting. I don't have a constructor that takes a, a string directly without, I have a field equals value constructor syntax. Right. So here you have two sets of square brackets, one to give the type and one to initialize. And maybe that's fine. Yeah, I kind of like it. Oh, there's a there's a theory on that one. So there's the multi-dimensional. Like, as long as you know the type, I feel like okay. you can just give JSON likes objects on the other side. Okay, so here here is uh hang on. Not 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 not. So I want to make an, an XY. I'm gonna pre-initialize it. And it's gonna be you know one comma zero, comma, you know, zero comma one. And the first, this is the, 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 the first thing is the type. Therefore I'm building a constructor. Now I have a type constructor and that is for an array is a nested pile of 
square brackets of the correct depth bottomed out as the type of the type of your right. array. All of your arrays get described by a list literal. All of your objects get all of your structs get described by a object literal. Yeah, the, the thing I don't have here is how do I do the same thing where I want to give you a length and I want to make a, a, a 99 by 99, you know, kind of thing, but that's ambiguous for certain array shapes. I think that's ambiguous. Certainly not easy to read per se. Um, if you have one dimension, yeah, okay, so in the one dimensional case, I can't tell the difference between a length syntax and an initialized value. A one dimensional array of one element of size 99 is ambiguous with a one dimensional array whose length is 99. Two dimensions I can tell because 99 is not an array of int. And we could argue that in the one dimensional case, I'm gonna pick a preferred version it's the length version. If you want a one, dimension. I think, I think that goes back to you know putting the capacity of the array in the square brackets. Yeah, was wrong to begin with, right? And if yeah, you I see. let that go and put it in parentheses after the closing square bracket, right? Then you only need it if you're not giving a literal to assign it to. All right. Somebody loves having their type, uh, their variable first, and then the type, but they put a a single dimensional as the rust. They put a single dimensional array. I think we need a two D array there. To make life gruesome, that's the whole point of the 2D array. The X, Y, colon, int is like, no, 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 no. Uh, let me scroll you up. Da, 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 da. A little easier to read or watch or something. And then if somebody says, initialize you all the zeros. Like if you, if it, I mean, you were asking about like uh, how do you distinguish between length and the default value that you initialize something to, and that that, that that's like one one syntax. Well, so it's like, a I, single right. So the default value, as soon as you're beyond one element, the default value is either a list of them. You give them all. You name them. That's it. Or it's just zero. You don't need a default value. I need a way to distinguish. So in the syntax I wrote there with bracket bracket in x y bracket bracket, I was looking for a way to distinguish. An initializer where I list all the elements versus just a length. And what Mark is saying, give up on uh, length and square brackets and use constructor syntax, whatever constructor syntax is. So let me go write my own example the third time with the constructor syntax, which is something like, you know, brackets here. And that's the that's the length, except that on a 2D guy, I don't know what the hell that means. So then arrays get two different constructor syntaxes, one where you list elements and the squares align up with the dimensions. And the other one is I use braces, which I've been doing for person objects. I've been using braces for constructors because it mimics the struct syntax. And literally I just had the parser call the block parser, which just expects the curlies. <laughs> expects How about something like x, y, zero? X, Y, zero is an int array. So brackets on the inside. And then it's, uh, oh, oh, you're saying it's just an array, but now the dimensions are whatever, however I give them. Uh, we you don't could put... change it to something like this to indicate it's 2D array if we feel like it. Um, and the constructor is, I see a bracket. I see an initial value and I see the dimensions. Um, always zero is so common, I would have said you skip the zero and then how do you tell the difference? So you, the semicolon tricks tells you that you're looking at a initialized versus a list of initial values. Right, so there there is an initialized with something, I get it. I understand that you, I, I actually almost never do those. It's always zero for me as soon as I do an array, almost without, without, well, without fail, um, which is why I don't really care for the syntax. Yeah, I actually also wonder how important is it to have this single yeah. value initialization for the array. You could just fill it up. 
but I, I do a lot of these arrays where I just have a list of things and I want them to be members of the array. And it's usually a one dimensional array. And I'm just listing like, like, I, I, oops, uh, print in the wrong place here. I, I have a list of keywords in simple because simple is a classic old school parser, right? So I have a, I have a, a, a here, do it your side. Key, keywords colon is an array of string. It's not even a, a zero. It's initialized to if and while and then and else and 27 more, right? That's a common use for me. It's reasonable. And, and even wanna... nesting things is fairly common of. And I do the nesting things happen. This is a list of persons that have phone numbers. So it's all it's all lists and dicks and lists. It's all only ambiguous when you get down to the list of one array of one element of ints, because the one element array of int has a thing. So that would be I have a, a foo, which is an array of ints. Now I want to make it. Okay. This is an array of one, or it's an array of one element whose value is one, or it's an array of length one whose default initialized is zero. Right? As soon as I say uh, uh, two, it must be a one-dimensional array because that's what I got. Oh, actually, it's a length. I don't. You're right. I can't tell. No, no. As soon as I have two or more, it's a. It's a. I would say it's a length. Always I would say a zero. A, I would say, this I would is say a, it's a value. Yeah, and as soon as I have a comma in there, I can say, "Oh, yeah. it's a list of values," and the trailing comma is optional. I'll ignore it. If there's only one, I don't care if you put a comma there or don't. But as soon as you put a comma, boom, you're a, a, a list of elements. And yeah, default initialized. I would claim I can't have a leading comma or I wouldn't, but I'd take a trailing comma, but I don't care. Hey, uh, Cliff. Yeah. Um, is your n by m uh, array uh, like uh, an array of arrays or is that just one big flat space where when you yeah, do... so we kind of went, you missed the first half conversation about arrays. We kind of went down the line of no one wants ragged arrays unless they know they want them and then they're willing to use a different syntax. So if you have a, a, a multi-dimensional array, it's expected to be dense. You must list all the dimensions every time you access into the dense array. And by dense, you mean it's all one big chunk rather than... One flat. One, one, one flat. flat yeah, chunk chunk Okay. Now I can give you a and if Java you're lucky, one allocation. I I can give you in a single allocation a Java style multi-dimensional array that is also flat and and can be accessed with fast array math into any direction. And that's simply by forcing all the arrays to be compacted together. And they can have embedded lengths and they can have marking class words embedded, and the array math can skip over them. But as long as they're all one big blob in memory. You get the fast access in all directions. I see. So there's a you know there's an argument here about whether or not I you know you need all the extra overhead for marking class for tiny arrays right. and whatever. Yeah. But it would be dense if you did a multi-dimensional syntax, and if you want a ragged thing, you'll say give me in Java you say give me an array of array lists, and then mm -hmm. each array list internally has its own raggedness to it. Okay. And if I want three dimensions of that, then I say you know, oh, list of array. by ragged you mean different lengths of like my x. You know, I have ten in x, and in my y, I have you know different lengths. Is that what you mean by ragged? V v ragged mean yeah, they're all very yeah. Okay. Like uh, I'm writing an adjacency matrix in a register allocator, even recently, and probably will again for simple. And, and so and one dimension is live ranges, and the other dimension is interfering live ranges. Right. Some interfere with none and some interfere with lots. And so it's short and long and short and long. And some are completely empty. So I have a marker saying nothing. So if it's not ragged, if I actually want an array that isn't ragged, that you know, my my Y or my M is always the same length on all of the all of the rows. Yeah. I would definitely want to use one big flat array and array math to Yeah. And oh, and okay. right. And then it would demand that you index into it with two dimensional array math. You give me both dimensions at once when you index into it. And the optimizer will do the shift scale add to do the math. Fine. Okay. But if you're a ragged thing, he's going to fetch a pointer, check it for null, say, oh, I'm an array list. It's not null. Do the length check on the internal versus capacity, then yes. index into the next dimension, right? So right. there's a bunch more overhead for the ragged guy. Yep. Okay. 
All right. A bunch of people have been writing here. Let me go stare at all kinds of things. Who comma says I made a default initialized to side length to array. There's another one with a semicolon in front. There's an array who contains a single element of a two as opposed to a length to array. It's a length one array whose contents is two. That's how I read that. They get that right. It's probably Matt. Yeah. Somebody's editing these. Foos. I'm just trying to make sure I understand their semantic intent. Oh, I don't like dot new. Yeesh. Hey, that's I, I like it. Then Good at least you. you don't need to add. <laughs> but at least you don't need to add special syntax, right? Like, and you don't need to repeat the type twice, anyways. If you have type inference, so you need to write a type at least once. Yeah, I don't, then... I don't, don't have any type inference in simple, and that's not been the focus of the language. So I'm kind of like. Mm -hmm. Instead, I'm, I'm staying away from type inference for a little while yet. Go to go to uh, uh, CodeGen before I get a type inference. So that's that's a little ways off yet. And then you know somebody will be jumping up down for me for emitting SIMD ops, and I don't do any any range checks. I have bogus range checks in simple right now. They they don't actually do the right thing. So the evaluator can range check and blow. Um, simple should emit a range check because then we can get into the optimization strategy of how do you optimize range checks um, where is oh, somebody's trying to chat there it is oh Matt's throwing links in okay as long as they make it in the link section I don't care yeah we, we done messing with some of these are reasonable. This is not this is not a terrible answer. Here I here right now I need the int somewhere because I don't know the the issue I have like like we're using int here but suppose I have an array of bytes which is u8. I have byte keyword for u8. Now you put a bracket 2 like that. The send it with element 2. Do you mean an array of bytes? Or do you need an array of ints? Do I allocate 64? Because you're gonna fill it in later? Or do I allocate a byte? So I don't have a uh when I look at this expression here, for me, I cannot infer that you're talking about a byte array or an int array. Which expression are you talking about? I highlighted, it, I highlighted like like I highlighted it in the docs. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so so the point of that, this kind of initializing style is because the type isn't mentioned on the bracket, I don't know how to infer the size of the elements. Mm -hmm. Same problem I have for the person array initializer. I get this style of person array initializer here. I don't know if you're talking about a nullable contents or not. Can I stomp a null down over one of those persons? Like I can totally infer that I'm making a person here. I have a bunch of persons. Actually, the syntax I'm using would be this, which is just fine, whatever. Okay, so I'm making a pile of persons. I got a person array. It has two elements. Okay, two element person array. Is it noble or not? I can't tell. As my, Why as do my you need to tell? Early, earlier comment where you start, you you didn't see no, so it's it's not noble. So. Okay, well, so so that that infers that implies. And, and this goes to match your question, why do I need? Because if I don't have this type here and I've just assumed a new, oh, what is okay. the type? Okay, the... I, I understood the syntax as it was written, but now now you really don't know. Yeah, now I don't know. Okay, so if you put the type in front, I'm okay. Same down here for this other guy in element two, if the type is in front, oh, it's this. I know what I got. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That, that's a, that, that one I can do. So <laughs> if the rule is, in an expression parse, if I see a type, then I'm about to make an object of that type. Now I'm looking for a constructor. If you're a person, I need curlies and then field assignments. And if you're an array, I need square brackets and elements, or I need something curly and the length. 
maybe the curly is the unambiguous version of things. Of course, if you already have to declare types, like if you don't have type inference and you don't even allow for var, like in this PS example, then I guess you would type something like person immediately, right? So you would have yep. something like this. Yeah, var was far was my right? point of, of saying I'm screwed up now, I'm I'm toast. But if you don't have type inference, then yep. I think at this point you are locked in. So because it has to be a non-nullable person. So the, the constructor has no choice now. It just has to obey the rules of the left hand side it's constructing. The, the, yeah, the, 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 problem, like, the, the problem you have here is that you have a syntax which says left hand side equals right hand side of a constructed thing, but actually that's not it. It's it's expert of whatever. I generate a, I generate an expression like the square bracket syntax of the body of expressors argument is a valid expression. What is the type of that expression? Is it oh, nullable array want, or not nullable? You array? want to make it an uh, expression like first class object on its own. They, they have to be. Why? The, par the, the parser. Okay, so they don't have to be. So so right now I can put a new anywhere in any expression is a first class citizen to say new of person of whatever. So there's a new, uh, I don't, I do not have to say new is immediately assigned to a variable. Instead, new is just, it's a first class expression element. So a square bracket constructing an array as a first class element works in a lot of languages and I'm okay with that. But then I can't tell the type except by inferring at looking at just the expression I have. Yes. And that expression doesn't tell me nullable or not. I and then wonder... I can make inferences like, since it doesn't have any nulls, I'm going to declare it not nullable. And if you wanted to assign over it, you have to put a null in there or you have to do something. But then I get another- Because you have to know the return value of the expression and sort of drive things up backwards. Well, no, then, then I'm doing type inference. It, as soon as I do a little- Type inference is not a thing you eat a little bit of. It seems to me that if you would like to make this initializer expression its own first class object, you have to think of it as an initializer literal that is convertible uh -huh. to whatever it is you are going to be initializing. So it may be convertible to initializers of a person array, for example. Um, so this would just be of type literal list of literal dictionary of name. I see there. Straight. Um, yeah, the, the thing, I don't have any literal notion right now. This would be, yeah, a, a fixed array of whatever. So one, one of the things that goes on with this, this question of type inference is uh, 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 I, I gave you... Um, you would need your types to generate a from literal thing. Uh huh. Because if I have a, 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 a not nullable array by default, and I put it in a person of not nullables, and I assign it to an array of persons which is nullable, I have a shared array. I can go to PS and pull a null out, right? So, so then then NPS says, well, I can assign a null. NPS of one is null. Then I go to PS and I say, oh, PS of one dot name, and I get an NPE fail. Right, standard standard collection problem of throwing uh, dogs into a cat array and declaring you an animal array. Right, suddenly I can so get you, the wrong type out. You have to track that. So even here, you you just copy. So well, yeah. but no, no. Now I have copy mm -hmm. semantics going on. Just copy. Yes. Okay, it's a gigabyte. Now I have two gigabytes, and I blew my performance and my size and my memory. I, I'm no no free mm -hmm. one gig array copies. Uh, totally doing the, you know billion row challenge. Those kind of things would have blown you out of memory. You just die. Okay. okay. Death at runtime via out of memory versus death at compile time for don't do that. You have to track that if if it's inferred to be non knowable, you have yeah. to throw error here. So, so in in the land of narrow ints, I cast. I have a well understood cast operator. I totally make a defensive copy of the int, and then I cast it to the narrow size by chopping bits. That's considered basically free on modern hardware. Fine. Mm. But for an array, where I have to make an entire clone of the array to, in order to change its type, no. That one, you need to ask permission from the dev, from the user programmer. Please mm. make a defensive copy or in the lifetime of PS or any number of things. As soon as I have arrays that allow not nullables, I actually have this problem. Now that I've said that, I'm like, danger, danger, Will Robinson. No, 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 no. Mm, yes. 
Yeah, so you can start with uh, non knowable, but at least you see if you see that it's knowable, then the whole thing becomes knowable. So... Well, but then I can't use PS. Mm -hmm. uh, like like right now, if if I were to do NPS here, the compiler would complain at me and demand a null check. Right. So if I say NPS of mm -hmm. one name, compiler errors says add null check, right? Mm -hmm. And then the null check is all inferred reasonably well. So NPS of one dot name, it, it, it is, it's not null. So then I can say NPS of, of one dot name and life goes on. Right. So, so there's some inference going on here that this, this, this level is done and it has to be more or less syntactically matching the if test with the consumption on the other side. And then I, I uplift, I cast NPS of one, two, or that value gets cast to a not mm -hmm. null and life goes on. So that's mm -hmm. that's a fine solution for what it is. But the PS gets away with it because he's not null and the assignment of PS to NPS, you know, it, it's an illegal mm -hmm. uh, widening cast. Yeah, we... Mm. We start to deal with in the flow. So here, the PS can 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 assume that it's not no, but here you cannot, and it it has demand. You you should demand the PS. He should PS, be check it. PS is demanding that his his array elements are never null. I'm never allowed to sign to them. So yeah. this is should be illegal. Yes, because it's taking. An expression yeah. of a not null variety and casting it to a nullable variety. It's changing so, semantics. So yeah, the, the the compiler should error there. And I'm not, I'm not certain if I can do that in a general way. Maybe I can. I don't know. I would say no. You can't do that. And then mm -hmm. you know, clone the array manually by hand. Yourself. Seems like that should be fine in one direction, but not the other. Yeah, I'm going the wrong way here on purpose. There if is I there. pass a oh, there is thing no, uh, into a function that wants an option of a thing. Fine. No, that one's a nullable thing, fine, because my not nullable thing yeah, also I satisfies thing. I can't do it for arrays because I don't have a type which says this array, while nullable, actually contains no nulls. I have to run over the body of the array to confirm no nulls. Either way, we here we are in the type inference and type analysis. Well, we're well in the so... type inference range and, and life is broken. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Like you, you make this giant array and you declare it nullable, that's great. Now I'm gonna pass it to a function which expects a not null. It's full of nulls, I can't do that. So he'll he'll blow up on me, so I can't take yeah, it. Yeah, you can't from... pass an array of nullable into a not nullable, something that wants an array of not nullable. Right. So the, the reverse direction, so oh, there's another aspect we're missing here that would save this, which is I hand it to you and at the time I hand it to you, I also say, you are not allowed to change the contents of the array. I have final fields. I don't have final array contents right now. Right, so suppose I just said that this is an array of final contents. I don't have that. I don't have any syntax for that. Um, right. So let's say I have a function that takes an array of not nullable. Uh-huh. But returns an array of nullable. Okay. Now, if you want to hand me something that is more strict, the problem is if you pass a mutable thing in, that is uh -huh. both your argument and your return value. Yeah. As soon as you return the thing, what you and just said was hey, the hey, directions right. in which you yeah. can be lenient. Like, yeah, yeah. You, you blow up. Right. Right. You can get more stricter. You can hand someone something stricter than what they want, and you yes. can accept from something something that is more lenient than what they're going to give you. Yes. But if I pass you a mutable thing, I have both passed you a mutable thing. I both passed you an array, and I have returned from you an array. Yeah. But okay. So so the answer in that one is if it's mutable, I can't allow you to uh, change the question mark ability of it. At least in one direction, and if it's not mutable, and if I have a def if I can describe a, a, an array where you're not allowed to assign into it except after construction, at, during during the initializer, so a final field has to be set in the uh, for a field has to be set in the constructor, and you can't actually reference that field until it's been set. 
So if I make a version of that for arrays that takes one of these syntaxes we have for pre-initializing and filling it with not nulls, I could in fact tell you I have a bang person, person bang, you can't change it. If I hand it to the NPS guy, this is legal. NPS forgets that he allows null, but because it's bang, the assignment is allowed to happen. He can't modify it. Then this is illegal because NPS is uh, not changeable. You can't change a, a contents in it. And and then, you know, then I'm okay. But now now I get into this weird, but now we're getting more types of things yet, you know, arrays that are read-only. They're constructed and read-only. I don't have that type yet. Maybe I could. I have fields that go that. They're initialized and then the read-only after that. Why not go to arrays as the same thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah fine. All right, I'm going to be done. It's fun conversation about all the ways you can fail on array syntax. Right now I have the obvious, it just does, just does, oh my God, so far up ahead, it just does this. And of course it's all immutable and you can assign nulls in and everything else. And we can argue another syntax another time when there's implementation time. I think long before I get down here, functions and then cogen. And then come back and revisit this. All right, done. I do like calling functions in my programs. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Not very many functions in simple right now. Therefore, all programs are simple. I do have a C, oh, we do have a brain fuck interpreter written in it. We do have a <laughs> prime finder, you know, some 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 easy straight up things, but there's a limit here. So next is functions for simple. Probably next is functions. And hand in hand with functions will become printf. Mm. And that, that would include a function that accept a function as an argument. Yeah, I'll make first class functions. No closures, but first class functions. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That 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 but you don't do closures, they're pretty straightforward to parse yeah. and implement and pass around mm -hmm. and manipulate and all that. Mm -hmm. Not a problem. Yes. All okay. right. Till next week. Bye. Bye-bye.